What's up all you mentees? Uncanny Omar here from Nearman Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And today I get to talk about some recent Dark Horse Collected Editions that have come out in the last month or so. I can't wait to talk about some of these books, so please stay tuned. And welcome back everybody. Before getting started, I want to thank the kind folks at Dark Horse for sending us copies of these collected editions. We have some hardcovers, we have some thick trade paperbacks, and we have some art books. And oh my gosh, do we have some hidden gems in here. Uh, so yes, these books have come out in the last month or so. I believe some of them are just now hitting the market. So all of these should be available as of this video. So we got a lot to talk about today, and I will be putting timestamps in the description of the video if you want to jump around to a specific book. So let's go ahead and get started with The Stone King. So here we have The Stone King. This is a pretty unique book, and I believe a lot of books are heading this route, where it was originally published in Comicsology, and now it got a physical collection. This is written by Kel McDonald uh, and drawn by Tyler Crook. Now, Tyler Crook, you might remember because of the work on the Harrow County books with um, Colin Bunn. Those were also published by Dark Horse Comics. Um, and it it's a fantasy story. It's a really quick read, and it makes me think that there's going to be a lot more of this particular world sometime later. But we have here Ave who's writing this creature. And this creature, I swear, all she calls it is Hey You. I don't think it ever um, got a name. And it feels like Shadow of the Colossus. She's riding around. There's this big uh, rock monster, which you can assume is the title of the book, The Stone King. And what she's trying to do is get to the very top to get these healing herbs from the shoulder of this giant creature. And that's what they grow. And these healing herbs, well, you could probably tell, heals them magically. Now, up there, she does find this particular stone. And she doesn't really know what it is, so she brings it back to her home. And she lives inside of this big city. It's called the uh, Stoneport. And Stoneport is, it's got this big wall around it. And she's also part of a thieves' guild. So she brings the stone over to kind of like the person that raised her. And she's like, oh, we can totally sell this. However... Seems like taking the stone was not a good idea because here comes the Stone King knocking down walls and tearing the city apart. So now it's up to Ave and Hey You and a new friend named Full who was part of the police guard of the city to go and find the stone and take it back to the Stone King. This is Full right there who she didn't really trust at first because he's part of the guard. So it's usually like they're enemies. She's a thief and he's a police officer. Uh, but they have to work together in order to get the stone back and then back to the Stone King. Because they think that's what's driving the Stone King mad. I love this book. I thought it was a really quick read. But like I said at the very end, I wanted a lot more. It seems like the ending leaves were more open. So I don't know if Kel McDonald is going to work on some more of this particular book. Uh, this one here retails for $9 and, oh, I'm sorry, $19 and 99 cents. And it has 129 pages. There are extras all the way in the back, which has the world of Stone King. So this is what makes me think there's going to be a lot more of these books, just because she put a lot of work into this. There's writer's notes in here. I think there's a couple, yeah these pages right here so we go from script pretty much the thumbnails to the pencils and then to the finished artwork and then the covers for each of the chapters so apparently there were a total of four chapters and then bios on the creators it's a great read next up is mother bridge seeds of change what stuck out to me was this beautiful cover there and this is written by George Mann, and it is drawn by Aleta Vidal. And it's a story about this futuristic world that a couple of decades before the story starts, there was this world mother. And what world mother, think of it like Mother Nature awoke. And it pretty much started forming bridges in these gaps around the world. So connecting everybody, uh, just 
pretty much just vegetation across the world. People were able to cross the globe. People were able to cross borders. Uh, they have been to places that they had never been before. People from the UK had migrated to New York. Uh, people from Australia were going to Africa and things like that. And then during the beginning of the story is when this particular vegetation starts falling apart and World Mother has just gone completely quiet. And because the World Bridge, as they call it, has begun to wither, the borders are now being reinstated. So people are putting up walls. Now we meet this lady right here. And this is Haley Wells. And Haley has been stuck behind a wall and she's looking for her family. She's looking for her husband and her kids. And when she gets out of this wall, it's when she meets these two characters right here of Contanza and Doyle. Now, this whole thing is about, of course, trying to find her family. But the other thing that I didn't state is that with this whole thing with World Mother, it also awakened these legendary magical creatures that are returning to the forest. So you see creatures like this, and Haley has some kind of connection to World Mother. And I guess that makes sense since she's a mother looking for her family and it's Mother Nature. So even though this is a journey that's filled with, I guess, natural magic, if you will. For some reason, I think of like natural wonders when I say that. Uh, but it's also about the strength of your own power and what you're able to overcome. And how the actions of a few people in power can cause pain for so many others because there's so many families separated. And, I mean, obviously, you don't have to be a freaking genius to figure out, you know, that this is just talking about, you know, some parts of the world that we live in. Uh, but what really stuck out to me in this was the artwork. I really enjoyed the artwork. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of language in here which surprises me for this kind of story about, you know, to me, it, it was more about families reuniting, so, uh, and just a little bit of violence. But that, that's about it as far as like any mature content or anything. These are the magical creatures. And this is the artwork that you're going to be getting in here. I believe this is straight to graphic novel. I don't think it was ever collected um, in a series of single issues. And the book retails for $19.99. And it has 88 pages. So this is another one that was a quick read. Okay. Another one that was a quick read. But I had to read it two times. This is Ray Fox in the flood this is a really unique graphic novel um so i whenever i start reading these books i don't read the synopsis i don't read anything in the back because sometimes i can spoil what the book is about after reading it one time i had to look at the back because i was like am i thinking that i'm reading the right thing here or is ray fox just way too smart for me so in this particular book, we meet a couple of characters. We meet the character of Mike and Clara, and they are married. However, they have been separated, and at first you don't know if it's surreal, if they're going through a divorce, and this is what's going through their minds. Um, but they have been separated by this big catastrophic rainfall. And now they're trying to make their way back to each other. Visually, holy crap, it's amazing and just the way that it's brought to life with all the colors it's disturbing at times but it can also be compelling it, you know as the water levels are rising trying to find each other but they're all going through their own unique thing so i feel like it's one of those books that is surrealistic on purpose right it's artsy it's but i will admit it is visually gorgeous and like I said, I was confused. So if you felt confused reading this or if you haven't picked this up and you um, are going to try it out, you're not alone. Now, for all the super smart people that got it right off the bat, they're like, oh, yeah, of course, there's an apocalyptic rainfall to people trying to find each other during this rainfall. Okay, awesome. Uh, where does the lounge come from? To me, it almost reads like a dreamlike story, which, you know, the visuals really set uh, the tone of the book. It's dark and sketchy. And like I said, almost like a dream, like you just woke up from a dream and you're starting to remember things and they start to fade away as the day goes on. Now, the sketchiness and the darkness wouldn't be the same without the colorist. And that's Lee Lowridge really puts everything together. And even though we're looking at two different scenes here, like I meant, like the cottage and then her in the club, it just feels like it's the same type of setting wherever they are, like how the colors bring everything together. 
really enjoyed it. Sometimes I need books like this, you know, from the norm. I had just been reading a bunch of, uh, was it the the Superman stories? I'm like, okay, I need a break, and this came at the right time. I was like, okay. This is interesting. I feel like it messed with my brain for so long that I had to go back and reread it. I think the thing that threw me off, I'm not gonna flip through the back here, uh, just were the two different settings. You know, uh, Clara is at a nightclub and Mike is outside in the valley and it's just, you know, the cottage is drowning. So I was trying to understand if this was going on in their minds or not. Maybe I went way too deep with it, but in the end it felt like a David Lynch film. So. I really dug it. All the way in the back, and believe me, these really don't help that much at all, are a Sketchbook and Notes by Ray Fox. Um, the book, by the way, retails for $19.99, and it has 107 pages. Here's the bio on the uh, writer, artist, and of course the colorist. And then some other comiXology books coming to Dark Horse. Now we're going to talk about the latest printing of Pearl. This is from Brian Michael Bendis and Michael Gatos. This is volumes one and two. Let's look at volume one really quick. And Michael Gatos and Brian Michael Bendis are the two creators of the Jessica Jones series, or as it was originally known as the Marvel Max series, Alias. Uh, but in here, it's a different story. And honestly, Michael Gatos, I feel like is experimenting. And it's not the first time I'm going to be saying that because... I feel like Alex Maleev is also experimenting with his art. Uh, these two are definitely mature content. But here we meet the character of Pearl Tanaka. So as you can see, she doesn't have tattoos. And I'll explain uh, here in a little bit why you see tattoos sometimes and why you don't. This is uh, Rick Araki. And she's a tattoo artist. Now she's a tattoo artist that works exclusively for the Yakuza. And then one day Rick gets in trouble and she finds out that she's a damn good assassin. So her Yakuza boss kind of forces her to become an assassin for her particular Yakuza side. Because there's a big war that's about to start. Uh, now, remember when I said you don't always see her tattoos? Well, it was her mother that taught her the, the ways of the tattoo, her art style. So she uses this particular ink that can only be seen whenever she's flushed with excitement. Uh, that's when you can see just her tattoos. I thought that was a really nice touch. And one thing you're also going to notice about her is that she's white, white. Um, I guess al albino or uh, suffers from, is it albinoism, I think is what it's called. Uh, um, I may be making that word up. But yes, so she stands out even above the American Yakuza. So this all takes place in America. Well, at least the first volume. And see, this is when she starts seeing or when you start seeing the tattoos. Again, violence, a little bit of sexual content, and mainly uh, language is what this one here has. Uh, let's look at volume two really quick because I did notice something pretty interesting that I never noticed about Gatos' artwork. So the first volume collects the first six issues. This one here collects issues seven through 12. And again, Brian Michael Bendis, the same guy that did Daredevil, uh, that did Spider-Woman, that did Superman, New Avengers, X-Men. He's written just about everything. Um, this is his particular independent story. This particular volume takes us all the way to Japan so she can learn more about her heritage, try to help her dad out who is in prison, uh, and still working with her Yakuza boss. So the thing that I noticed about these volumes and i never noticed about his art it feels like at times that gatos is just drawing on top of pictures like he takes a photograph of people and he's just like putting inks on top of those pictures it just really throws me off and i'm not sure if that's the colors or if he's just taking pictures of his models because we know for pearl that he uses a model yeah the pearl model is exotic alex so i don't know it just feels really weird like there, it looks like at times there's just photos and he's just putting inks on top of it. Kind of weird. I'm not sure how I feel about it, but like I said, it could be just an experimental face. Uh, both volumes have a little bit of extras in the back, like interviews and sketchbooks. Can't show all the sketches because some of them are not safe for work. But you'll get sketches like this. 
and each one of these retailing for $19.99, and they have about 160 pages in them. Joyama. Man, it's going to be hard to pick what my favorite book of the bunch was. But this one here comes really close. So the first thing I want to say is that this immediately I connected with because I thought it looked like a manga. It looked like a Katsuhiro Otomo manga, like something from a Child's Dream or even Akira. Just this particular picture with the landscape of the city in the background. Silas here, who's one of the main characters in the foreground. Uh, here's the back of the book, the book retailing for $19.99. And I think it's supposed to remind me of a manga because it's even in black and white, like the book itself. So let's open it up and look at it. It is in this thick matte paper. So I love the way that this opens up as the camera kind of pans out away from the city. And you get to find out exactly what the story is about because the story is very trippy. It's very Blade Runner. So even the plot kind of reminds me of something like from Ghost in the Shell or Battle Angel Elite or Akira. So we see an escape happen here. Somebody in a cloak, so badass figure, because the action sequences are so nice to look at, uh, comes in, ripping through the door of this police car, and it looks like he's breaking this person out of this escort. However, it's not. It's kind of like a mission to go and kill this particular person. He breaks him out of prison and says, you know, you failed us. You failed the organization. So he's like, okay, you remember, you got to kill the person that did this to me, the person that made me blind. So it's like a revenge story. So you get this particular flashback. It looks like there's a kidnapping attempt and you get to meet the person that took out his eyes. And that is Arwen. And Arwen, along with her two friends, the guy in the front here, Silas and Ringo, are part of these, I want to say, kind of like the Punisher village, village... Uncanny or more talk pretty one day. Vigilante group known as the Outrider Soldiers. So she's got some kind of powers. You know, she can throw knives really well. It's, so you feel like there's some sci-fi elements here. Um, and the art. Oh my gosh, the art. So these three friends are kind of trying to solve this particular crime. It's There's some, of course, Illuminati type of things going on. It's all about a crime syndicate. And, of course, all the influential figures in the city are involved. Uh, so they are t told to stop uh, trying to figure out this crime. Uh, but the three of them don't quit. I really like the relationship between them. It's a little awkward at first, uh, the way they interact with each other. Now, something horrible does happen to them. But oh, let me just show you these fight sequences, how easy it is to follow and why it reads like a manga but it's, you know, done in the traditional left-to-right format. So again, 219 pages. The book retailing for $19.99. This one does continue, so there's going to be a volume two. But just check out that artwork. So, you know, if you're a fan of manga, absolutely check this out. I think it was done on purpose to look like this. And it's one of the books that is a little bigger than your standard trade paperback, too. All the way in the back, you have the extras, like this alternate cover to Volume 1. Some pinups and sketches and character sketches back here. Oh, this is Ruby, who I didn't talk about, who's the sister of one of the characters. And then there's the advertisement for Volume 2, Creator Biography. I love this book. It just kind of blew me away. To kind of give you an idea of how much bigger it is than your standard trade paperback. It's just a little bit bigger as far as the length of it. Here we go. You get a little bit more art in there. So it does stand out. And it's just a slight bit shorter than your standard trades as well. All right, it's spine watching time. Here are all the spines of the books coming out, well, that have already come out this past month. These are all the smaller size books. These are the trade paperbacks, but all of them together. So you can see some of them have different dimensions. Some of them are a little bit taller than others. And that's not very uncommon when it comes to different publishers. And here are all the bigger books, the spines of the bigger books. And keep in mind the wind of Numacera. That one is in soft cover, but really should be a hard cover. It's a beautiful book. Scarlet. This is a thick book at 528 pages, but this collects all of Scarlet, uh, collecting the first series, issues 1 through 10, 
and then series two, issues one through five. Uh, written by Brian Michael Bendis and drawn by Alex Maleev. Uh, the two gentlemen that worked on Daredevil, the two gentlemen that went over to work on Moon Knight. They had a Spider-Woman run. Uh, but yes, they are no strangers to working with each other. And this is their latest independent creation. So this is creator-owned. It was published before by DC. It was Actually, it was published as an absolute. Uh, but the absolute only had the first 10 issues. It doesn't collect the next five. So it's not complete. Uh, it was published over by Icon, the Marvel imprint. But now it's being published over at Dark Horse, where Brian Michael Bendis has taken his stuff. Uh, this one is a pretty unique read. Um, I had read the first 10 issues before I hadn't read uh, part two, so I wanted to go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, it's unique in the way that she kind of breaks the fourth wall and the character of Scarlet talks to you. Uh, so the story is pretty familiar. We meet this redhead named Scarlet. Uh, she's standing over a corpse, and she's, like I said, breaking the fourth wall, talking directly to us, talking about her first experiments, her first true love. Why did I go with experiment? Uh, <laughs> first true love, uh, boyfriends, and things like that. And speaking of boyfriends, that's who we meet through a series of flashbacks. We meet her boyfriend. So this is Gabriel, her boyfriend. And both her and Gabriel are being hassled by this cop named Gary Dunes. And... He ends up killing Gabriel. And not only that, but then he's framed as being a drug kingpin. And now Scarlet, you know, has vowed revenge. But it's interesting because she takes it to the extreme where revenge is not just getting back this guy. But she starts... At first you think it's accidental, but then as you read it, you'll see. Uh, she starts this whole movement, this revolution to overthrow the corrupt leaders of the world. Like I said, not just that police officer. Not just police officers in general, but corrupt politicians. Um, and honestly, the thing that stands out to me, though, is that first-person narrative. It really gets you into the story. Breaking through the fourth wall. Now... I don't know if that's for everybody. Some people might think, oh, it's a little too Deadpool. But it's not, really. I mean, she just fills you in on the parts of the story that you need to know. Um, so, to me, you know, uh, on my channel, I think I've gone about Brian Michael Bendis. I'm not a big fan of his X-Men run, his uh, Avengers, but whatever. But when it comes to his creator-owned stuff, he kicks all kinds of ass, and this one is no exception. And, of course, you have... Alex Maleev's artwork. And much like Michael Gatos, I feel like... I think this is Brian Michael Bendis uh, doing this particular flashback. Much like Michael Gatos, he's looks like he's experimenting with his art uh, through a series of the flashbacks, like just using the different tones and things like that. So this is all the big fight against authority and, of course, almost like a social commentary on what's going on in the general public nowadays. Um, but then again, this story was written over... I want to say 10 years ago. But much like a lot of stories in comics, though, they're just all still relevant. So this is Scarlet and mature content for mainly violence and language. Let's look at the extras here. Because there are a ton of extras. The cover art there. There are variant covers as well. And again, Alex Malief supplying most of the covers. No, Michael Avon Oming does a couple of them too. A couple of the variants. There's the script, and there's a lot of script in there. The sketchbook. Those are some of my favorite things to have as extras. I mean, this has over a hundred pages worth of extras. Here's the artwork that we saw a little bit earlier. That I think it is uh, Brian Michael Bendis. Some beautiful pinups back here. Making sure I can show them. Well, couldn't show that last one. So there's a little bit of nudity in here. But this is Scarlet, the big thick edition. Retailing for $29.99. For 500 plus pages, it's a hell of a deal to try it out if you ever wanted to read it. Winds of Numacera. Oh, this was so good. Could not put this down. Read it cover to cover. Uh, it is a paperback. And it's also a magazine size type of collection. I wish this had been a hardcover. It does have a unique, like, here, let me show you, sewn binding, glued binding mix, which you hardly see in paperbacks. It's very uncommon, but you do see them from time to time. 
It's just such a beautiful book, all written by Morgan Rosenblum, um, Johnny Handler also do, doing some of the plot, I believe. The artwork by Eduard Petrovich, who does the art for chapters 1, 7, and 8, I believe. Eduardo Mello doing the artwork for chapters 5 and 6. Uh, Alessio Moroni doing chapters 2 and 3. And I think Felipe Andrade did one uh, particular chapter. But all of it brought together by the colors of Valentina Tadeo. This is a fantasy story in this particular land of Ethera. And you start with a story that happened five years ago. You get to meet uh, these two characters right here. Uh, this is Krill. He's a stable boy. And we'll see what happens to him in a little bit. Uh, you have the Empress right here, this little princess. Her name is Lelia. And there's a huge war going on. And her father's making these executive decisions. He's the king. He's the one that's like, no, we got to keep moving with the war. His council is like, no, sir, we got to do this. Anyway, later on, five years later, you get to find out that um, the king passed away. Something happened to the king. Uh, now we see the characters a little bit older. You see Krill, the stable boy. Um, and then you see... The, oh, I'm sorry. This is also the introduction of another character. This is the character of Kelisandra. And she just wants to be a knight. She's from another land where her father rules that particular land. But this is what the princess looks like now. And she is now in charge of Numacera, this empire, who has kind of outgrown itself and has taken over different lands. Uh, here we have the character of Jorsa, or jo I believe Georgia. Oh man, I can't pronounce it. It's like S J O R S J A. Um, and he's a barbarian, and he's a part of this barbarian tribe with his father and his brothers. And they're not exclusive to just men, there's also women barbarians there too. And it's just this beautiful artwork with the colors that bring you in. Uh, there's a little bit of language in this, and mainly it's the violence that probably gives it its rating. But the violence is so badass. Anyway, so the story is that Krill hears, because he sneaks into the castle a lot, overhears exactly what happened to the king. The king ended up getting killed by his own council. He was poisoned. So now he's kind of been framed for murder. Uh... The council is like, no, no, this kid is now wanted. We need to kill him because he killed one of the guard, breaking into the castle. So he kind of runs away from home and, because of happenstance, runs into Kelisandra. And now she takes him almost like a squire. And they go on their own adventure. So really the only character that is on the cover that hasn't met the other three characters is the barbarian. I'm just going to call him Jorza. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that name. Um, but yeah, they all have their own unique stories and unique adventures. The princess is trying to bring the kingdom together. She's doing things that is shaking up the council again, like her father did, but the exact opposite, where he was more violent and less forgiving and wanting to take over people's lands no matter what. She's more like, well, I don't think we need to have slaves anymore. We should free them. So that really gets a lot of people upset. So she's roaming the land, at first looking for a suitor. That's what uh, the, um, her advisors wanted her to do. But later on, she just wants to get to know the people of the land. And I thought that's really cool. So she's a kid. I think at the time she's only like, I want to say 12 or 13. She's not even a teenager. Well, when you read this, you'll find out why I know the age because in here something happens um, to her. To her body. Anyway, that sounds really weird, but when you read it, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, but yeah, she's a young kid, not even a teenager, trying to unite this land that's kind of falling apart. And yeah, we, you get to meet different races through here. Uh, there's like these beast men race. They were ones that were kind of um, slaves in this particular city. And that's when she just had enough. I fell in love with this. I could not put it down. It was one of the better reads I've had this year. And I cannot believe I have to wait on volume two. Because I have to find out what happens. How do these stories connect? Damn. Uh, there are some extras in the back. Which gives me hope that there's a lot more planned. So you have about the authors here. But you also have the winds of Numacera. It looks like a hardcover concept art book. That seems to be available right now. There's the card game. So it looks like it's a huge world that they're hoping... 
Uh, more and more people come back to the comic. This was great. Uh, volume 1 has 226 pages, retailing for $24.99. You know what? I take it back. This was my favorite read out of the bunch. 100% recommend. Next up is The Art of Trover Saves the Universe. Had to get this. I'm a huge fan of Rick and Morty. So this is published by both Dark Horse and Squanch Games. And this is pretty much picking up a story that is guided by this little narrator here. Taking you through just different um, unused artwork right here. This little guy will do the introduction. Uh, there is a little bit of language in here. But it's just concept art and then a commentary about the concept art. So if you're a fan of Rick and Morty. And this you don't have to have... Um, played the video game Trover Saves the Universe <laughs> to enjoy artwork. I haven't, uh, but my brother has, and he's the one that told me that there was an art book coming out that Dark Horse was uh, helping to publish, and he knows how much I love art books, and he knows how much I love obscure characters, whether they're from Rick and Morty or whether they're from their own creator-owned game, Trover Saves the Universe. It's like, well, I gotta get it now. So it's pretty unique because, like I said, you have a narrator kind of guiding you through the concept art, whether it's the backgrounds or the characters, and unique in the way that, you know, it's written. If you're familiar with that kind of humor that's in Rick and Morty, that's exactly the way that this is written. This book has 192 pages, uh, retails for $39.99 because it is a hardcover, and mainly the the thing in this one is the violence right like that's the only thing that i see as far as like any kind of mature rating just the, over the top violence like that so if that's your type of humor absolutely get this book there's nothing really grotesque or weird in this because well it's all a video game and i haven't played it so i don't know if there's anything really weird or over the top that might come back and bite me later uh the paper quality in this is this thick glossy paper uh the binding on the book it is glued binding, but at 190 plus pages, I mean, you don't really need the sewn binding for it because the book lays over really nice because it's just so big, whether you're towards the front or towards the back of the book. But this is The Art of Trover Saves the Universe. And speaking of art books, here's Dapple Daydreams. This is the art of Camilla De Rico. Now... This one, the only thing I will say about this one is it does have a little bit of nudity in here. Uh, but that's about the only thing I will say that could keep people away. Uh, and this is uh, Camila De Rico, who did the artwork on, oh, what was that book called? I really enjoyed and just her artwork is so different now. Uh, Tapopo, that was it. It was published by Boom. Uh, this one retails for $29.99 and it has 144 pages. And it's this type of artwork you're going to see in here. Just this fantasy type of art with just beautiful colors uh, painted in oil. Actually, I think most of the uh, work in here is painted in oil. That is definitely Princess Mononoke type right there. She has a thing for like animals on top of little girls' heads. Yeah, this is the art style that's very reminiscent of what she did in uh, Tapo Tapopo, I believe is what it was called. If memory serves me right. And man, that is gorgeous. Now, towards the very back, she does have some, like, I think it's the process of the artwork. Yeah, process paintings. So all the way in the back is where she gives you the process of how she paints with, like, a blank canvas. And then she's able to create all these little fine details and all of this done in oil paintings. There are, like I've mentioned, some pencil drawings here, but it's mainly oil art. And in the back of the book is this nice little image, 144 pages, and this book right here has sewn binding. But that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing any of these books, don't forget to check out our sponsors. CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you mentees. 
If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. If you live in Europe and are interested in pre-ordering or purchasing Omnis, then you should definitely check out Walt's Comic Shop in Berlin, Germany. They have the cheapest pre-order prices for Marvel and DC big books within the EU, Flat shipping of 990 euro for EU countries, extremely careful and sturdy packaging, emails are answered within 24 hours, and they have a superb selection of new releases and out-of-print books on their website. Just head over to waltzcomicshop.com for more great deals and rare titles. And for a limited time, you can use the code near min condition, all one word, at the checkout for free shipping to all EU countries with your first order. Walt's Comic Shop, your reliable source for Omnis and premium collected editions in Europe. And that was my overview for this particular Dark Horse Collected Edition month. Let me know in the comments down below which ones you're picking up. If you already have the Brian Michael Bendis books in different imprints like uh, Icon or the DC, I think the Absolute Scarlet. But Absolute Scarlet didn't have as many pages, so, so it wasn't complete. It didn't have the second series. Um, if you've read any of these, let me know which ones you've been enjoying, or if you've read any recent Dark Horse books, which ones you have enjoyed. This was The Uncanny Omar. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe, ring that bell for notifications to let you know when our videos are going live. We are on Spreadshop and Patreon. Amazing ways to support the channel if you can do so. More importantly, everyone stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.